So electrons repel one another, and that's what gives a molecule its three-dimensional shape. Okay, so I'll give you guys a second to copy that down. It is. I've had a pencil sharpener the whole year. All right. So uh, we have an example down here with methane, CH4. So C yeah, methane, not meth. Okay. Everyone always thinks I'm going to make meth or something. And I blame that show Breaking Bad. But I have to let you guys know, I will never make meth. How do you make meth? Take organic chemistry and you'll find <laughs> out. But I will never make meth because I can't go to jail. If you look at me, I won't survive in jail. Anyway, uh, <laughs> methane is uh, CH4, and we have the Lewis structure, right? This is what we would typically draw. But we know that inside of the bonds, right, we know that the chemical bonds are made up of electrons. And so because of that, these bonds are going to push each other away. And so in reality, if we drew a 3D structure, this is what methane would look like. Now, you guys see the shaded arrow right here, right? The shaded arrow is basically us representing that it's coming out of the page. Okay, so it's like coming towards you. Okay. So the shaded arrow means that it's coming towards you. And these dashed arrows is probably it's the opposite. So it's gonna go into the page. Okay, so this is how it would look in a three-dimensional shape. Uh, would have We would have one hydrogen going straight up one going kind of diagonal to the side, and then one popping out of the page, one going into the page. And that you can kind of visualize what it would look like, right? It's like a little, like a teepee kind of. Yeah. I would attempt to draw it, but I'm not a very good artist. So kind of like, wait, did I draw that correctly? Kind of like that, except there's a four. No, that's three. Yeah, I'm not gonna attempt to draw it. Sorry guys, drawing's not one of my gifts. So just so uh, know that the, sh the, the filled in arrow is coming out of the page and the dashed ones are going into the page. And then if we kind of represented it with like uh, balls and sticks, it would look like this. Okay. That's pretty sick. It is. It's incredible until you start drawing them. Okay. So um, again, these uh, bonds, we call them electron domains because are, they are regions where electrons are most likely to be found. And so when we draw these 3D structures, we need to keep in mind two different domains, the bonding pairs, which are basically these chemical bonds. But we also need to keep in mind the lone pair electrons, okay? Because we have some examples down here, but the lone pair electrons here are also going to push the electrons in the chemical bonds away as well. So we need to keep that in mind, okay? So just know the electrons inside the bonds push each other away but also the electrons in the lone pairs are gonna push each other away as well, okay? All right, <clears throat> any questions? Are you guys ready to try these problems? Yes. Okay, so before we move on, what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to go to Canvas and I want you guys to look up um, or inside our unit module, you'll see something called the molecular geometry chart. Okay, now you're gonna need this, a copy of this out. Um, I'm not gonna really print it out for you or anything. Um, you'll need to refer back to it during today's lecture. Um, but here, it gives you a chart that tells you hybridization, which we'll go over in a second, the number of bonds and non-bonding uh, non pair of electrons, and that's gonna give you the molecular shape. So here we have the names of the molecular shapes and just kind of a general skeleton of what that shape looks like. Okay, so take a minute, pull that up and then kind of peruse it. And then we will go over how to use this chart.
All right, everybody got this chart up? All right, so if we go back um, to the problem here, we're gonna be uh, determining the electron domain geometry. So basically what shape is it using the handout? So here we have um, NH3, we have ammonia. Now, what we wanna do is when we're trying to figure out the geometry, you wanna figure out two things. Okay, the first thing you wanna find out is the number of bonds. Okay, number of bonds. And what this means is attached to the central atom. Okay, so number of bonds uh, for central atom. Okay, whatever is in the middle, we want to find out how many bonds that central atom has. Okay. And then the other thing we want to determine is the number, or not the, yeah, the number of lone pairs. Okay. So if you have two non-bonding electrons, you would have one lone pair. If you had four that were non-bonding, you would have two lone pairs. So we're gonna look at um, NH3, and then let's figure out how many bonds there are. So how many bonds are there attached to the central atom? Yeah, three, right? There's one right here, one right here, one right here. There's three attached to the hydrogen. So we have three bonds that are attached to the central atom. And then how many lone pairs are there on the central atom? Yeah, there's one pair, right? One lone pair because there's the non-bonding ones right there. And so we have three and one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our electron geometry chart and we're gonna look at what the geometry is. Okay, so we just look for three and one. And so here we go, we have our geometry and our geometry, it says it's tri trigonal pyramidal. That's how you say it, okay, trigonal pyramidal. So trigonal pyramidal. Okay. And we can, if we wanted to draw this in the three dimensional shape, it'd be very simple. We have our central atom, right? Uh, we have a we have a lone pair electron, so we're going to put the lone pair there. Now this lone pair is going to push this H away from itself, right? So it's going to push the H like this, and it's, and these this uh, this bond right here is going to push this electron these electrons away, and the lone pair will push this one away. So this one will probably come out of the page, and then that means the third one will go into the page. And so it kind of makes like a little pyramid shape. Um, if you want the skeleton uh, shape right here, it's gonna look something like this right here. Okay, trigonal pyramid. Okay, so it's gonna look something like that. All right, so I know that was a lot of information, but do you guys have any questions how we found the geometry and how we kind of drew the shape of it? Hopefully not too bad. All right, so I'll give you guys about two minutes. I want you guys to do the same thing for ozone right here, O3. Um, see if you can figure out the geometry name and see if you can draw the, the shape, okay, the three-dimensional shape. All righty, so hopefully you guys got it. <clears throat> so if we look at ozone right here, um, how many bonds are there on the central atom? Yeah, there's two, right? Because there's one single bond and one double bond. So we can say that it's uh, two bonds, okay? All right, and then um, what about the lone pairs? How many lone pairs are there on the central? There's one. Yeah, because there's two lone pairs. Okay, so if we go to the chart we can just look up the number of bonds as two and then we can look up the lone pair so basically you just kind of want to look for the one that looks similar so we have two uh for the number of bonds and then we have our bonding pairs which is our non-bonding pairs which is one and so we have our shape which is angular and so you guys can you guys can actually see that right here in the example oh three Another term that I think is used a bit more com commonly is bent, right? Very creative name. And so we can, you can either say angular 
but I like to use the term bent. Okay. All right, now, if we were to draw the 3D shape of this, we would draw the central atom. Now, if you guys notice, we have a double bond here, right? Now, one thing you want to keep in mind when you're drawing double and triple bonds is that, remember, they're very strong bonds, right? It's very tight. It's a very tight relationship between the two elements involved. So when we draw um, 3D structures that have double and triple bonds, they usually don't like to move. And so what we do is we're just going to put the double bond exactly where it was. And everything is going to kind of be based on the double or the triple bond just because it's such a tight connection. And so everything else is going to shift because of the double bond. So here, the double bond is going to push the lone pair electrons kind of to the side right here, right? Because in the, this picture, normally we would just draw it on top, but it's going to shift the lone pairs over a bit. And then that's going to cause the single bond to shift as well. So it's going to look kind of like that. And so you guys can kind of see how the shape is going to be a bit bent. Now here, we don't have anything coming in to the page or going into the page or coming out of the page uh, because everything can kind of just stay flat. It's maximizing the angle of the electrons away from one another. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. So notice how it says like certain degrees on the shapes, right? Mm -hmm. Will there ever be like a problem where it's like, oh, it's be much wider, way less? Yeah. So um, actually I'm about to get into that. So yeah, so if we go to the next part of the problem, if you notice, um, all of these uh, structures have generally the same shape, right? We have one on the top, right? We have an electron group coming going into the page, one coming out, and one on the side, right? But if you guys notice, they all have different angles, okay? And the angle is going to depend on what type of connections there are. So here we have uh, four single bonds, right? Here we have three single bonds, but one lone pair. And then here we have uh, two single bonds, and then we have two lone pairs. Now, if you guys notice, as the number of lone pairs increases, what happens to the bond angle? Yeah, so if there are more lone pairs, it means that the bond angle decreases. And that kind of gets into uh, your question, Josh. Um, sometimes on the AP test, especially on the MCQs, it'll tell you like the bond angle. You don't need to memorize these bond angles, um, and, but it'll tell you, hey, CH4, um, it has a bond angle of 109.5. And then it'll say, so do you think the bond angle of NH3 is going to be bigger or smaller? And about what is it going to be? And so that's kind of the questions that you'll see on the exam. You don't need to memorize these values exactly. I'd say if you were to memorize one of them, it would be the 109.5 for this for a tetrahedral molecule. That's the shape of this guy. Um, but that's really the only one that you would need to memorize. Memorize. Okay. Does that answer your question? Sure. All righty. Any questions on finding the geometries? Oh, one thing I do want to mention is that you don't, have to memorize all of these. Um, I would say the ones that are really important, um, and I'll tell you guys them right here, um, but linear is pretty important. It's just straight. You probably want to know that one. Uh, trigonal planar is pretty important. Uh, the bent one is important. And then tetrahedral. I say these four are the most common uh, and the most important ones. So I'd say uh, memorize those. Uh, but the other ones, um, just be familiar with the names. Um, and so just know that there is a trigonal bipyramidal. There is a seesaw, uh, but you don't need to like memorize and memorize them unless you really want to. Yeah, so just don't be confused. If on the test you see seesaw and you're like, dude, that's fake because there is a seesaw shape. Yeah, seesaw. Hmm? Seesaw? Yeah. Oh, I'll show you Seesaw. Um, seesaw is this one. Some of the names are different, um, but Sawhorse, I've never heard Sawhorse my whole life. Um, but Seesaw right here. But if you guys notice, it kind of looks like a Seesaw shape, right? Yeah. But yeah. 
for the eight B test, is it gonna have all like the future stuff we're also doing as well? Yes. Oh, the one that we're taking next week? Yes. No, I'm just gonna have the stuff that we cover. It's gonna be cumulative. So it's gonna include this unit. Yeah, it's gonna include this unit. I know. Horrendous, right? Okay. So this next section right here is called hybridization. Um, you're gonna have to study this on your own. I have a I summarized what comes out in the book on the class workbook. So if you want to uh, read through this and it makes sense to you, um, you guys can just use the class workbook, but I highly recommend reading this in the book. It is part of your assigned reading, which I know that all of you guys do every week, right? Yeah. And then uh, you guys can also watch a couple videos just because we don't have time. We're not going to be going over hybridization, uh, but this is an important topic in this unit, but we just don't have time to go over it. So I know, just do what you guys are doing and keep reading the assigned reading, which everyone does. Yeah, and fun. then uh, you should be good, okay? We all have A plus in this class. You do, you do. I <clears throat> 100%. Oh, no. All right, so I'm actually gonna leave uh, 9.25 just because it's based on the reading. And so you guys can try solving this problem out on your own, but we're gonna move on to molecular shape and polarity, okay? No. Not that kind, not that kind of polar. Santa's not real though, guys. Yeah. You know, I was that kid in first grade that told everybody that. I got in trouble. My, yeah. My mom was the mom that's like, we're not gonna let no white man give you presents. I'm the one that's buying everything. <laughs> hey, dude, your parents gotta take credit. <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, let's go over a shape and polarity. So we all know we already talked about uh polarity, right? We talked about how. If one element in a bond is uh, more electronegative, it's going to cause more of the electrons to go to that side. And that's what causes polarity. Now, this effect causes something called a bond dipole. We've already talked about this. It's where one side of the molecule has a partial positive and one side of the molecule has a partial negative. We talked about HF as a good example of that. F is more electronegative, and so it causes more electrons to go to the F which causes it to be that side to be a bit more negative. Okay. Now, just to review uh, before you guys, we go in more detail about this. I want you guys to look at these four compounds right here. Um, you guys can split it up with the person next to you, but I want you guys to draw the shape of that compound, the Lewis structure. You don't need to do the three dimensional shape. And then I want you guys to figure out which side of the, uh, of the molecule is more polar, or if it's nonpolar, you can write that it's nonpolar. Okay, so try that out. We got four different compounds. I want you guys to draw the Lewis structure, and I want you guys to indicate which side is more polar. And if it's not, we can just say it's nonpolar. Okay, so I'll give you guys about two minutes, three minutes to work on that. All right, so <laughs> let's uh, let's draw the structure for these uh, these compounds. So I'm gonna go through it very quickly. Uh, before HCl, you should have gotten HCl like this single bond. Uh, for CCl4, you should have gotten uh, C in the middle and then the Cls around it. Uh, for NH3, we actually saw a picture of this earlier, but you have nitrogen as a central and then three hydrogens, lone pair. And then we have BF3. Uh, and so you should have this best friends for freaking forever. Right, that's that's the that's the symbol, right? BFF. -F -F. -F -F. <laughs> All right, so now we got to draw the polarity. So um, HCl, very easy. Uh, which side is more polar? CL. Yeah, CL. So we would draw an arrow like this, just to show that it's more uh, more negative on the CL side. What about CCl4? Yeah, this one is nonpolar. It's actually easier to think about this if we uh, think about the 3D structure, because if we if it looks like this, for example, uh, we would have CL coming out here. We would have a CL on the side. We would have a CL coming out here. And if you guys notice, basically every part, every side of the molecule has a CL around it. And so overall, it's going to have a nonpolar charge because it's going to be negative on the inside or outside and then more positive on the inside. Okay. <clears throat> All right. What about NH3? Is this polar or nonpolar? It's polar. Which side is polar? N the yeah. The side with the lone pairs are going to be 
the more polar side. So this one is polar and it's going to go towards the lone pair, right? Because there is nothing more negative than an electron because an electron is what makes things negative. And so if we have two naked electrons on one side, that side is going to be a lot more negative. Good. All right. And then best friends for freaking forever. Is this polar or nonpolar? This one is nonpolar. Same reason as CCL4, because every single side is um, has an F on around it. So you guys can kind of think of these as like force fields. It like makes a force field and it's like negative. Yeah, they're also best friends. Interesting. I like your social commentary in this, Molly. It's very interesting. <laughs> I should. It'll be like those. It'll be like those sports games. Mic'd up. Mic'd up. Mic'd up in AP Chem with Molly. <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on. So I wanted to go over polarity because this is going to lead us into definitely in this unit, the most important thing, um, but probably the most important thing in the first semester other than stoichiometry. Um, I don't know if you guys have gone on the AP classroom, but if you see how the test is broken up, um, intermolecular forces, this right here is the topic that covers like 25 to 30 percent of the questions on the AP test. And so this is probably the most important thing to understand, but it's not too bad. You guys just need to remember opposites attract and, op and say like charges repel and just be able to recognize um, how one side is going to be more positive, one side is more negative, and the, how that is going to cause molecules to interact with one another. So the basic principle is very easy. It's something that you guys all know about. It's just once we start applying it in more complex situations, it can get a bit more difficult. So just make sure if I, you have any questions at any point, you let me know um, so I can stop and go over it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the guy that coined the term. But it's called London dispersion forces, but we just call it dispersion. But anyway, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> so intermolecular forces. Now let's define what that means. So if you guys look here, intra, right? Intra is a prefix that means inside or within. So intramolecular forces are forces that are inside the molecule. So what we talked about earlier, like polarity, things like that, that's intra. Now, inter is the forces between molecules, okay? So if I had HF, for example, uh, intramolecular forces would be like the fact that one side is going to get more of the electrons. Um, intermolecular forces would be how does HF interact with other molecules? That would be inter, okay? Yeah, English. Okay, so intra is forces within, inter is forces between. So for this part of the unit, we're going to be looking at multiple different uh, molecules, sometimes different groups of molecules, and we're going to be predicting how they interact with one another based on their polarity, usually their polarity. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, intermolecular forces, they're generally weaker than intramolecular forces. So for example, if we have uh, the intra force, like the single bond right here, the single bond is stronger than any connection that HF could have with another HF molecule, which makes sense, right? Your connection to your arm is stronger than you holding hands with someone, right? It is a lot easier for me to break your holding hands apart than for me to rip your arm out, right? It's, why, why is I just want you guys to visualize it very well. Is that, is that what Ted Bundy got? Is that what he got? No, I'm not going to chaw off your, saw off your head. Anyway. Because then he's like, oh, I want to challenge. So he challenges. No, that's not what Ted Bundy was thinking. Anyway, uh, so for example, it takes less energy to melt something than it takes to break its covalent compound, right? Because when you put water on a stove, it's going to start boiling and turning into individual H2O gas molecules rather than breaking the H and the O bonds, right? It's easier to separate the molecules of like a bunch of different molecules than it is to break the actual molecule itself. Now, there are three different intermolecular forces. 
that we're going to be taking a look at. The first one is dispersion forces. Next is dipole dipole. And then the last one is hydrogen bonding. Okay, so you guys don't need to write that all down. I'd say write down this one because this is the first one we're going to get into. But we're going to be looking at dispersion forces. Yeah, you can call it London dispersion forces. You can call it dispersion forces. Can I just call it London? You can call it London. I don't know if the FRQ graders will like that, though. Because they're not British. Anyway, so London dispersion forces, very easy to understand. Um, so we know that electrons are constantly moving around an atom, right? So here we have an at, a picture of an atom and we have the electrons. And we know the electrons are constantly flying around, right? Now, they're always in movement. So depending on where the electrons are at any point, it can create something called the instantaneous dipole. And there's a picture of it right here, right? Because electrons are always moving, right? But if more of the electrons are on one side of the atom, what happens? Well, that side is going to be a little bit more negative, right? Where, and the other side will be positive. But those electrons are moving. So if they move to the other side of the atom, that side is going to be a little bit more negative now, right? And so that's called an instantaneous dipole because it's instantaneous. The dipole can change depending on where the electrons are moving. Is that why uh, they draw from negative? Okay, this has nothing to do with British people. Okay, so if you guys take a look at this, um, you can kind of see an example of that. Electrons move around. Now, one thing I do want to mention is that this usually happens or only really happens with big atoms, okay? This happens with big atoms because big atoms have more electrons, right? And so there's a higher chance for the electrons to group up on one side of the atom. So London dispersion forces usually happens with big atoms, okay? And the term that we use for how easy it is for an instantaneous dipole to be created is called polarizability. And so, do you have a question? Oh, Sorry. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at 9.27, and we're going to be looking at a group of elements and compounds. And I want you guys to figure out, hey, which one of these is going to have the lowest and greatest boiling point? We said that London dispersion forces, because let's say, for example, um, we have an atom, right? We'll call it atom X. Okay, if one side becomes partially negative, right, and one side is partially positive, and there's an atom X right here, what's going to happen to this side of the second atom X? What's, what's, what's going to, what kind of dipole will it want to create? Yeah, it's going to want to become positive, right? And so if one of, let's say, for example, let's say atom X, we'll call it X1. If X1 gets a partial negative on the right side, right? And then there's X2 right here, and there's electrons flying around. There's a negative on this, on this atom, and that's going to cause the electrons on X2 to go to the other side, right? And that's going to create a partial positive here and a partial negative here. And they can form an intermolecular force where they have a connection because one side is negative and one side is positive. And so if enough of these atoms create this in instantaneous dipole, what happens is they slide, they're going to start sticking together. Okay. Does that make sense? Again, it's negative, positive, and then they attract to one another. Oh, I agree. Okay. And so we'll do uh, A together and I'll have you guys do B on your own. But again, the stronger the intermolecular force, the greater the boiling point, right? Because if they're more tightly together, the harder it is to break apart. And so let's take a look at this. We have Ne, argon, krypton, and xenon. So I want you guys to take a look at your periodic tables. So we have neon, argon, krypton, and whatever the other one was, xenon. Okay, 
So if you guys take a look at the periodic table, you'll see the four noble gases that we were talking about right here, okay? We got these right here. Now, what did we say about uh, dispersion forces? What's the trend for dispersion forces? Not more electronegative. Exactly. The bigger the atom, so make sure you guys jot this down somewhere. So the bigger the atom, we know that it has more dispersion forces. Okay, because the bigger it is, the more electrons there are, the higher chance of one side becoming more electronegative or not electronegative, partially negative, partially positive. So out of these four, uh, which one is going to have the most dispersion forces? Yeah, xenon is going to have the most dispersion forces, right? Xenon has the most dispersion. Okay, so if it has more dispersion forces, is that going to lead to a stronger connection or a weaker connection? Yes, yeah, stronger connection, right? There's more IMF. Okay, intermolecular forces. Because if it's more likely for xenon to get a partial positive and partial negative, higher chance there is for it to connect with other xenons and have a stronger connection. <clears throat> and so if xenon has more IMFs, intermolecular forces, is it gonna have a higher boiling point or a lower boiling point? Yeah, it's gonna have a higher boiling point. Higher. Okay, and that's the kind of the gist of what we're trying to get at here. Okay, xenon is the biggest, so it has the most dispersion. If it has the most dispersion forces, it has more IMF, and then it's going to have the highest boiling point out of the four that we're looking at. So we can kind of put them in order, right? Which one has the next highest boiling point? Yeah, krypton and then argon, and then neon is obviously the lowest. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Yes, there's neon gas in there. And then there's electrical, there's a wire that goes through. Remember we talked about uh, ionization energy. What's the term I'm looking for? How, the, how if you put energy into an atom, when the electron changes energy levels, it releases light. That's why neon lights have a specific color. It's because of the electrons falling and rising. Yeah, it's like math. Okay, we're moving on from London. We're not calling it London, Molly. As a proud American, we left that country for a reason. Anyway. Talk about American Canyon. No, Crania Americana was not scientific. It was a it was an, it's an art, artifact. All right, and it's very racist. Anyway, uh, let's look at F2Cl2, Br2, I2. So now we're going to look at molecules because molecules can also have uh, dispersion forces. Same principle, though. So I want you guys to take a look at F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, and I want you to put them in order from lowest to greatest boiling points. Oh, okay. Are you talking about the element? I don't even know what you guys are talking about anymore at this point. I don't know about that, but... No, we just talk about random things. I think it's my fault. I set the precedent. It's because I go on these rants. But I mean, it still gets the job done. If you have the students stimulate, um, if the students are constantly receiving stimulus and they're constantly paying attention, just to uh, take in more information. Mm. That would be like psychology. I've never took psychology. <laughs> All righty, you guys ready to go? Okay, so we have F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2. So we're going to take a look at the periodic tables again. So we have F, Cl, Br, I. Now, these aren't the molecules, but it's basically double that, right? Because it's the same thing. They're all diatomic. Now, what did we say about the trend? The bigger the atom... Yeah, bigger the atom, the bigger the dispersion forces, right? More dispersion. I'll just write DF. Okay, dispersion forces. 
Now, same thing applies to molecules. The bigger the molecule, the more dispersion forces, right? Because there's more electrons to move around. And so if we take a look at this, which one do you think is gonna have the least dispersion forces? Yeah, fluorine is gonna have the least dispersion forces. And so if we have F2, F2 is the smallest out of them. So F2 will have the smallest, so it's gonna be the least. And then followed by Cl2, followed by Br2, and then followed by I2. I2 will have the most dispersion forces, so it will have the highest boiling point. Okay, make sense, guys? Yeah, so the bigger they are, the more electrons they have naturally, right? And so the more electrons they have, the more polarizable they are. And so that leads to a greater chance of them creating, you know, a dipole based on the dispersion forces. And then that's going to cause them to kind of stick together and have the greatest uh, boiling point. Okay. All righty. Let's uh, move on to the next one. Now, this one is my personal favorite because I like the name, it's called dipole-dipole, okay? So dipole-dipole forces. Um, and so um, these happen in polar molecules. So you know how we talked about how some molecules permanently have one side that's more negative than the other, right? Good example of this is water because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, right? And so, and there's, two lone pairs there. And so there's gonna be a permanent dipole towards the side with the lone pairs, right? And so one side will be permanently partially negative and one side is permanently partially positive. That gives rise to something called dipole, dipole forces, okay? And so polar molecules that have a par permanent partial positive and negative, it causes them to interact with other ones that have a permanent positive and negative. So here we have an example. We have this, um, I don't know, what does this look like? This looks, okay, anyway, we have this molecule right here. One side is permanently positive, one side is permanently negative. We have this little chart right here, right? And so because one side is permanently positive and negative, it's gonna interact with the permanently positive and negative sides of the other molecule. So you see how the negative side here is interacting with the positive one here? And the positive is interacting with the negative one here. And it makes this big chain of connections of intermolecular forces. And that causes them to interact with other compounds. Okay, so same principle as before. The more polar it is, the stronger the dipole force. Because one side is going to be super negative, one side will be super positive. And then the stronger the IMF, the harder it will be to break those, uh, connect, those intermolecular forces. Okay, so as long as you know this pattern, uh, you should be able to figure out the dipole-dipole forces, okay? Okay, so again, if you take notice, it's the same principle as dispersion forces. It's just that dispersion forces are when it, there's an instantaneous dipole, and then here there's a permanent dipole, okay? Now, let me ask you guys a question. What do you think is stronger? A dispersion force or a dipole-dipole? What is stronger? Okay, you said dipole-dipole. Why do you think it's dipole-dipole? Because the dispersion force is dependent on the amount of the molecule. Same thing with dipole-dipole. We're talking about groups. Well, like, I mean, like, in order for, like, the dispersion force to, like, exist, right, because it's instantaneous, right? Mm -hmm. So, in order for it to, like, have a stronger bond, it would need so many more, like, good molecules. No. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to take a shot at it? Yeah, Mel. I think Okay, because it, okay, for sure. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Love you. Oh my goodness gracious. I'm gonna ban that word from this class. All right, so let's uh, think about this logically, okay? So if we take a look at uh, London dispersion forces, I'm gonna pull up a blank screen real quick just so we can take a look at it. But if we take a look at dispersion forces, right? London dispersion forces. 
Uh, are they permanent? No, because it's based on what? The electrons moving around, right? So we have the dispersion forces. Again, dispersion forces are based on the electrons moving. Okay, and then we said that one side of the atom can get more electrons, right, than the other side. And that's what causes there to be a partial negative on one side. Okay, now dipole, dipole. See, I want to abbreviate this, but I know what the abbreviation is, and I know what it stands for in meme culture, so I can't abbreviate it. Okay, dipole, dipole. It's going to be a permanent partial charge, right? Okay, which means that one side permanently is negative, one side is permanently positive. So for example, we go back to our water molecule. We have one side that is permanently positive and permanently negative, right? Now, if we compare the two of them, we're trying to figure out which one is stronger. Let's look at dispersion forces. Now, dispersion forces is based on an instantaneous dipole. So even though it's making an intermolecular force with another compound, do the electrons stop moving? No, the electrons don't stop moving, right? They tend to group up on one side, but they can just as easily go to the other side, which means that dispersion forces, this is not permanent. This can change, okay? It's very changeable, okay? Whereas dipole-dipoles, the partial positive and negative is, in, or is permanent. So it will not change. So once they're locked in with each other, they're pretty locked in. So which one do you think is more strong, dispersion or dipole? Yeah, dipole is stronger. Make sure that you guys take a note of that somewhere, that dipole, dipole is stronger than dispersion forces. This will be very important when you're comparing uh, different intermolecular forces. Yeah, what's up? In a way, dispersion has less polarity. Yeah, in a sense, just because the polarity can change, yeah, within that atom or molecule. And so it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's just not permanent, like dipole, dipole. So one side, it could be negative, and then it tends to stay negative because it's interacting with the positive side. But if the electrons start moving over to the other side, they're no long, it's no longer like that. So it's a, it's a bit weaker. Yeah. So <clears throat> Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's why single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, intramolecular bonds are much stronger than these because they're, you know, they're like permanent, permanent. You need to put in actual energy or more energy to break them apart. And so, yeah, just make sure you guys keep that in mind because you will have to compare it during the AP test. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm just saying I was close. Close, yeah. Good All right, so we're going to take a look at 9.28. Um, I want you guys to read this question. So just because we're going to take an uh, AP practice test soon, a full length one, I want you guys to read the question and um, just kind of explain the answer. Okay, see if you can write like a full length sentence. Yeah. Just a rule of thumb when you guys do your FRQs, um, you shouldn't be writing like essays. It should be very brief and concise and to the point. Yeah. You guys probably learned it in your English classes, but less words means more. Maybe yeah, you no, did. Like, oh, but yeah, when there's <laughs> writing, it's it's always less is more. The, the honor in these classes are so like stupid. <laughs> All righty, let's uh, let's finish up this problem. No thrashing other classes. Like, they don't teach you to write; they just expect you to know how to write. That so too. yeah, so we need like that's why so many college students don't know how to write. They're like, oh, you're fine. You're there's a lot of adults that don't know how to write either. So it's like a lot of people start complaining nowadays that, that most of our college students don't even like give us like a thing other than forfeit. As much as I can agree, writing, you know? Yeah, honestly. Well, it depends what you're trying to do in life, too. But. <laughs> you're going to need to know how to write reports. <laughs> All right, so try to read that question. Um, see if you guys can figure it out.
All right, I'll give you guys another minute to finish that up. Sorry, guys. My neighbors are very funny. Ah, uh, no. Acetonitrile is pretty compostable, too. Yes. Usually, if you see anything with a carbon-carbon chain, like C connected to C, it's gonna it's gonna, it's gonna be pretty combustible. We use propane because um, see how it has a very uh, low boiling point. Because what is it? If we subtract or rise two seventy three, so two thirty one minus two seventy three. It's negative 42. And so what we can do is when we put in those tanks, we can increase the pressure, bring the temperature down, and it'll still stay a gas. And that's why we like using propane. Uh, we can use methane and stuff, but it's so small, it tends to leak out. So propane is a pretty good size. So it kind of like fits the best of both worlds where it's very compressible, stays a gas, so it stays light. Um, at the same time, it's, it doesn't leak out as much. So if I remember correctly, methane is more exothermic, so there's a greater enthalpy of reaction. Um, and also you can you would get more moles of it per gram, right? So for us, like weight and uh, is very important too. Um, so yeah, it would be more efficient, um, but it's also harder to keep and maintain. And so there's like there's so many things that go into it. Yeah. Would propane just be a little bit behind? Yeah, it's not a big difference. Yeah, it's not a huge difference. You can actually look up what the what is it, the heat of the reaction is. All right, you guys ready to go? All right, let's see if you guys got it. So I'm just gonna go through it. If you guys um have any questions, make sure you guys let me know. And let's see if you guys got something similar. So if we take a look at this problem, it's said it's telling us that acetonitrile it has a boiling point of 355 Kelvin. And propane has a boiling point of 231 Kelvin, even though they have similar molar masses. So here we can already see that acetonitrile, it has a higher boiling point, okay? So far so good? All right, so it has a higher boiling point. Now, if it has a higher, higher boiling point, what can we automatically assume about it, Yamal? Yeah, the polarity is higher because yeah. yeah. So the polarity is higher, but even, even before we go to that, we can we know that if it's a higher boiling point, we can kind of guess that there's more intermolecular forces, right? More IMF, because um, that's what keeps the molecules together, right? When we think about solids, liquids, gases, we're not talking about the intramolecular anymore. We're talking about how the molecules are stuck to one another, right? And so there's more uh, intermolecular forces. Now, if we take a look at acetonitrile and propane, what do you notice about the two of them? Acetonitrile is polar or nonpolar? Yeah, this guy is polar, right? But if you look at propane, propane is what? Nonpolar. So that's the key thing that you guys want to point out, that acetonitrile is polar and um, <laughs> propane is nonpolar. So Acetonitrile, one side is going to be permanently negative, and that's the side with nitrogen, right? Because nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon or hydrogen. And so one side is going to be permanently uh, negative, one side is permanently partial positive. Now, that allows us to figure out that, hey, acetonitrile has intermolecular forces, and specifically, we can say that it has dipole dipole intermolecular forces, right? So this is kind of the thought process you want to go through. Obviously, you'll think through this a lot faster than I'm talking about it. Uh, because, and also we know that propane, 
right? The only intermolecular forces that it's going to have is dispersion. Okay. okay. And it's because it's nonpolar. Whereas acetonitrile has dipole dipole because it's polar. So if we wanted to articulate this in an FRQ, we want to make sure we say as much as possible without writing too much. And so um, I don't know if my answer is going to be like the perfect answer. It's probably not. Um, but the way that I would talk about this <clears throat> is that acetonitrile has a higher boiling point than propane despite having similar molar masses because acetonitrile um, molecules have dipole dipole uh, bonds with one another okay. because acetonitrile it's polar. And then you would say something like propane is nonpolar, which means it only which means the molecules only have uh, dispersion, intermolecular forces, which are weaker than dipole dipole. Something like that. Yeah, super low because yeah, it's nonpolar and it's really small, which means the dispersion forces are very weak too. And so they just can't stick to one another. No. Okay. And if you want it, I guess you could, oh, sorry. If you wanted to, you could actually write a little bit more, um, just kind of concluding everything, just kind of wrapping it up. You can just say something like, um, what is it? Acetonitrile having stronger intermolecular forces increases the you know bonds intermolecular forces between one another, which makes it hard, which uh, makes the boiling point lower, something like that. But this should be fine as an answer. Okay, now what, there's two things I do want to mention before we move on because I've noticed this in your FRQs, and the first thing that I want to mention is you want to keep your answers concise. You might want to jot this down. Keep answers concise. You don't want to write long, long, long paragraphs about what's going on um, because what the AP graders are looking for is that if you have a very logical step-by-step -step approach, like if you look at this answer, it's very logical, right? First you say acetonitrile has a higher boiling point because it has dipole-dipole bonds. And it has dipole-dipole bonds because it's polar. Okay, and then end and, and sentence. Propane is nonpolar, so it has dispersion forces only. Dispersion forces are weaker than dipole dipole. And that kind of tells them that, hey, this person knows what they're talking about. There's a logical flow to their argument. I guess writing a conclusion here would be helpful, but you don't have to. Second thing, um, you never want to, I know that when we talk about molecules and this chemistry stuff, we kind of like to humanize these atoms, right? We say that fluorine wants one electron, right? Or we say that um, acetonitrile molecules want to stick together, right? We say that one side um, might want to stick with another side. You don't want to humanize these atoms. So don't humanize um, chemistry because fluorine does not want anything. Fluorine, fluorine is not sentient. These molecules aren't sentient. They're just working kind of off these natural laws. Um, we talk about them in terms of human terms just because it's easier to understand, right? Like, oh, this atom wants to stick to the other one. It's a very easy way for us to understand it, but just make sure when you guys are writing your answers, you don't use those kind of terms. So don't use uh, terms like want, need, uh, likes. You don't want to use those kinds of terms. Always stick to kind of, I guess, dehumanize these things. Okay, just keep it kind of uh, naturalistic. All right, so uh, we're gonna finish up, but I'm gonna give you guys a seven minute break real quick, and then we'll go to the last IMF, and then we're gonna kind of combine it all together, and then we'll be all done, okay? Shouldn't take more than uh, 20 minutes. I've been going kind of slow though. 
teach kids like to understand that these words are bad. Like say the words and be like, don't say those words. So you're gonna say it. All right. So um in intermolecular forces, we talked about dispersion and dipole dipole. Now there's a special type of dipole uh intermolecular force, and the special type is called hydrogen bonding. Okay, you guys can probably tell it has to do with hydrogen. So hydrogen bonding is a special type of intermolecular attraction between um, an H atom in a polar bond. So when H is connected to F, H is connected to O, H is connected to N, um, there's a big electronegativity difference, right? So if we have H bonded to F, F is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen. So it's gonna take a lot of the electrons and that's gonna make hydrogen super partially positive and fluorine super partially negative. And so since hydrogen is super duper partially positive, it's going to um, interact with a non-bonding electron pair of a small electronegative ion. So we have some examples here. So if you take a look, let's take a look at the red hydrogen, okay? The red hydrogen is bonded to oxygen, right? And so oxygen is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen. So it's gonna make hydrogen super partially positive. And so if it's next to another very electronegative element, it's going to form something called a hydrogen bond. And this is the strongest intermolecular force, okay? So it goes dispersion, um, dipole-dipole, and then hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole-dipole, granted, but it's the strongest form, okay? So another example right here, hydrogen is bonded to an F, so it's going to go super toward, the electrons are going to go super towards the F, which is going to make hydrogen super duper partially positive, which is going to bond with the negative fluorine. Okay, and then you see some more examples right here. Hydrogen and nitrogen, hydrogen and nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen. It doesn't have to be the same type of molecule. It just has to be um, between hydrogen and F, hydrogen and O, hydrogen and N. Fon. Okay. Or NOF. Or ONUF. Yeah, often. Okay. Easier way to think about that than these uh, really bad uh, sounds is just right here. Yeah. Okay, so again, uh, just to reiterate, hydrogen bonds are a type of dipole-dipole, but it's super duper strong and special because nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine are some of the most electronegative elements. And so a bond between hydrogen and any of these makes it extremely polar. Okay. Uh, if you want to try uh, 9.29 on your own, you can do that. But just for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to the last topic for today and the unit and the semester. <gasps> okay. Any questions? Okay. So the last thing we're going to talk about are ion dipole forces. Okay. An ion dipole force is between an ion and a polar molecule. So up until this point, we've been talking about neutral elements, right? Like or molecules. Now, we talked about how certain molecules are super duper polar, right? So for example, water again, okay? We know that one side is partially positive, one side is partially negative. And so if we have an ion, which is the definition of being positive and negative, right? So for example, Na+, it's going to create an intermolecular force. So I take it back, hydrogen bonding is not the strongest. This is the strongest ion dipole forces um, because it's the interaction between a polar molecule or atom and an ion. Okay. Yeah. And this is why salt dissolves so well in water because it breaks down into Na plus and Cl minus. And then all these water molecules come and then jump them together. And then so the pop polar, the, po the positive side of water is going to uh, bond with the negative chlorine. And then the negative side of water is going to bond with the Na. And it literally just molecularly just rips it apart from one another. Jump up. Yeah, literally just jumping them. It's not. Oh, goodness. Okay, so if we wanted to compare um, intermolecular forces, this is a little handy-dandy chart you can use. You guys don't need to memorize this. You guys just know the thought process already. So if something is polar, it's going to be the super strongest, stronger side. So ionic bonding is literally intramolecular bonds. The strongest IMF, so this is the strongest IMF, um, is going to be ion dipole, then hydrogen bonding, then dipole dipole, morning, then dispersion. Happy Tuesday. If you need to be screened, please report to the auditorium during lunchtime. Anyone who needs COVID screening, please report to the auditorium. Thank you and have a fantastic day.
equal to four. Okay. So that's pretty much it. That is unit nine. That is semester one. Congratulations, guys. We are all done. Okay. So just know um, ion dipole, strongest IMF, hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole dispersion forces. Okay. Well, it's like one of those choice games where yeah. like it leads to a different answer. Every time. It's like Plinko. Anyway, um, in terms of your homework for this unit, it's going to be due um, the day of the test, which is going to be um, next Wednesday. This is a wrong class. Next Wednesday. Um, the next time we meet, we are going to do some FRQ prep. So I'm going to give you guys some FRQ questions to, that we can work on together. Um, and then we're going to take a full length AP test as our final. Now, to prep for that, I recommend just going back through the old homeworks, um, old assignments. The most important thing that you guys do is practice problems. So don't just read your notes. Don't just watch these lectures. That's the worst way to study. You want to go into your homework, um, the tests that we did, the practice books that I posted on Canvas, um, or go look up questions online because doing questions is the best way to prep for the test because just reading is not gonna get you anything as you guys probably already know, okay? Just make sure you guys do practice problems. If you need some, um, let me know. I can provide some for you. I'll probably direct you to the books that are posted on Canvas. But again, doing problems is the best way to prep for our final and AP test, all right? All righty guys, that's pretty much it. Congrats on finishing semester one.